ionized energy. How artificial leaves can solve the global energy crisis. Daniel Nocera, Harvard University. On the 9th of November 1989, I was glued to CNN, amazed at what I was seeing, a new dawn in humankind. So I'm going to be out of step with a lot of things you just heard, because I don't want people to go to cities. When they go to cities, they'll build that, those wires, and they'll feed it with coal. It will be even easier to keep those people with energy. Um, you'll want renewable energy. You won't want it, somebody else having it, you, because you'll hold it in your hand. And if you do that, you can address some of the things you heard today uh, most directly. So I want to begin with what era you're living in now. You live in an epic called the Holocene. It's a 10,000 year epic, and in the Holocene, when it started, there weren't many of us, so we didn't alter world systems. A new word that you've heard recently is called the Anthropocene, because now there's so many of you, you are altering Earth systems, and you hear things like climate change. I don't really care if you believe in it or not. Um, I wish if you don't believe in it, I would like to be like you, because then I wouldn't feel so neurotic. <laughs> but <clears throat> that's what the Anthropocene is. Anthropocene is. I want to introduce a new term called the sustainocene. And when you think about sustainability, this is what people think about the earth, plants, ecological sustainability, environmental integrity. The contention, however, is you can't have that if you don't take care of one thing, and it goes back to today's first talk. If you have a huge imbalance in society between the haves and have-nots, it's impossible impossible to have an ecologically sustainable world. And that actually was a term coined by Brian Furness, a physician. And my contention is if I can get poor people energy, I can solve a lot of problems. Now, that is kind of a subjective statement. Let me be more scientific. I can actually put an equation behind this. So the amount of energy you use depends on three things. First, how many are there of you? Because you all use energy. We could calculate today, you ate around 2,000 calories, it's over 24 hours. You're all 100 watt light bulbs. That's why you look so bright and shiny to me right now. Depending on where you live, you have a GDP, gross domestic product per capita. So if you live in a very wealthy country, then you have more energy needs around you or energies being supplied to you. And then also, the final thing is, if you could grow your GDP and use less energy, then you've conserved. So you shouldn't talk about conservation as some hand-waving thing. It actually is an equation. I can calculate quantifiably con conservation. When you multiply everything together, you can find out you're left with energy. So if I know population, money, and conservation, I can calculate energy. So I did that a few years ago. I calculated the global energy use, and you were around 16 terawatts. So what does that mean? You were burning, the Earth is burning a 6 trillion watt light bulb, and you need to keep it on. You keep it on mostly with coal, oil, and gas. It turns out by 2050, I know there's going to be 10 billion of you. I can then do estimates of growth. I'll just do a 2.3% growth rate. And then I have to make a calculation on conservation. And then when I did that, I got a number that you'll need 16 terawatts more of energy equivalents. And the scary thing is when I did that calculation, I assumed in 40 years you would be saving every bit of energy you use today. If you don't, you're going to need 32 more. I'll just give you an idea of the magnitude. If I took the fastest growing crops in the world and planted them on all the available agricultural earth on the face of the planet, you would only get six terawatts. If you want eight terawatts with the nuclear power plant, you're going to have to build 8,000 of them in the next 40 years. And then remember, you've got to decommission and then start rebuilding. So you'll be building 8,000 nuclear power plants forever if you want eight terawatts in nuclear. 
So that's a lot of energy. And then you can say, well, if you're conserving all your energy, why do I need so much more in it? Because it has nothing to do with you anymore. It has to do with the poor. There's three billion people who will be born. There's three billion people who are low energy users. When you take those six billion people, they are driving energy needs. And that's why this is synonymous with the sustainacy. If you don't take care of those people and they reinvent your energy system, you won't want to see what that future Earth is going to look like. So it really comes down to the poor for the future in energy. And you will do the right thing. There are economic drivers that will help you do the right thing, but it just won't matter unless you take care of the poor. And that means you have to do science in a different way, and I call it frugal innovation. It's got to be simple and cheap. It's got to be not complex, and you don't want a bunch of engineers designing your energy system, because it costs money. Now, what really it comes down to is, this is me doing research, so as you get older, you don't go into the lab, you sit on Google, and you make Google plots, then you run in the lab, you tell your students, look what I just invented, and they tell you, go back into your office, old man, and leave us alone and let us keep doing important work. So here's my latest invention. Um, I calculated, I took what's a Boeing 77 cost? And then I divided the cost by the weight. And then I said, how many did they make in 2006, 74? And I did that for everything else. And you can see I have a curve now, so I can predict manufacturing costs. Not for pills, not for commodity chemicals, not for pharma or Intel chips, but I can do it for machines. And what you see is you want to be lightweight. If you're lightweight and you can make a lot of it, that is good. You could say 777s don't look much different than automobiles. Well, this is true. I did call McDonald's. If you take the weight of the patty, the tomato, the lettuce, and the bun, it's $10 per pound. And the problem is, that's not how you build energy systems, like a hamburger. You build them on the other side. You build one big centralized thing. It weighs a lot. You need a high cap X capital expenditure. And I set up a business model to collect money from you. That's why the poor do not have energy, because they don't have the money to pay for the big thing. Thank God. So we're simple in how we think, in my group. If that end of the curve isn't working, then you turn your eyes to the other end of the curve. And the question is, can I build an energy system that looks like a hamburger that I give to everybody, and they generate their own energy? And the place we decided to go look was photosynthesis. That's something that's very lightweight. It's distributed. And what you do is you take sunlight and you rearrange the bonds of water to make oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen then gets fixed with CO2 to make sugar, but that's a dark reaction. All the energy storage is up front in water splitting to make hydrogen and oxygen. To give you a feeling of how much energy that can be, if I take the Harvard swimming pool and now I give you all some little energy system that looks like a hamburger. You have the sun. And I operate on one pool of water globally per second. I don't use the water up because somebody else in the world's taking the hydrogen and oxygen, recombining it, getting water back and the energy out. So I'm just cycling one pool of water. How much energy could I save or have for the planet? 38 terawatts. So do you realize I'm telling you only need one-third a swimming pool of water and a distributed energy system, and I can take care of your energy needs? Sustainable, no carbon. And that's why it's going to happen. The question is, how badly do you want it? But you're going to go back to this. Remember, this over here, the centralized model, is a new experiment. It's only 150 years old. That worked for 2.8 billion years. So ExxonMobil, the big oil companies, they're the flaming liberals in the energy art because they're, only using, they're using an energy system that's only 150 years old. You can't be more conservative than me. I want to go back to what's worked for 2.8 billion years, which is sunlight plus water. 
That's a hard thing to do. In 1912, here's a quote, could we emulate photosynthesis? That would be good for human happiness and replace coal with photochemical reactions that have been the guarded secret of plants. Well, let me tell you how a plant works. Sunlight comes into the membrane, <clears throat> and I don't want to go through all the details, but I'm going to treat it as a systems engineering problem. Sunlight is hard for the plant to get its hands around, so when the sunlight comes into the photosynthetic membrane, it actually moves charge. It moves an electron one way, and a hole the other way. When you have moving charge, that's current, but there is no wiring. It then does it four times, and when it's done it four times, it splits water to oxygen and hydrogen. There's a whole complicated chemistry there because electrons are quantum mechanical and protons are classical, and you have to learn how to couple them. So we spent 10 years of our lives learning how to define proton coupled electron transfer. But what we said is, let's listen to the plant, and we'll do the same thing. We'll make something where light comes in, we get charge that separates in a wireless way, we'll feed it to cofactors that can do this proton-coupled electron transfer, we'll have to have four units of charge, and then we'll split water to make oxygen and hydrogen. In that sense, functionally, I'm doing exactly what a leaf is doing. So this is what we did. It took 25 years of work to get all this chemistry and reaction chemistry together. But we took silicon, and then we put one of these conducting transparent oxides you heard about earlier. Because when you make oxygen, oxygen plus silicon makes SiO2. That's sand. That's bad. So we protect the silicon. And then we have these special catalysts we made that are better than photosynthesis. You heard today that in photosynthesis, you get reactive oxygen species, and the plant degrades. The special thing about these catalysts is they're the first self-healing catalysts. They fix themselves as they work. So they break down, and they reform, and they break down. The beauty about that is you can use any water source. So we set out to do energy, but if you can take urine, which this will work in, to hydrogen and oxygen, when you recombine it, you get clean drinking water. So we made this system, and it works just like I told you. Light comes into the silicon. We have to put an internal electric field. I don't want to talk about it. It's called a heterojunction. The holes go to the top, and the electrons go to the bottom. So could you play a movie? You literally just take that thing, drop it in a glass of water, and I guess we're not going to play the movie. No? I just like looking at myself anyway, so this is good enough. <laughs> but you can literally just walk up to the window, and you'll see it just start splitting the hydrogen and the water into hydrogen and oxygen. I told you it would look like a hamburger. It looks like a hamburger. The silicon's the patty. The ITO is the cheese. My catalyst is on the top. The other catalyst is on the bottom. It's just coatings. We can literally just coat semiconductors as they fly by. So you can now imagine everybody having their little hamburger. <coughs> All they need is sunlight and water, and they're good to go. Simple engineering a lot of science discovery underneath. So you've done it before. You heard about mainframes. Your grid is the mainframe. You went to personal computers. You go to personalized energy. The key here is you're redistributing wealth because you're redistributing energy. You start to put the poor and the rich on equal footing because when people have access to energy they can manufacture, that's tied to GDP. That leads to education. That leads to population decline. So to end, Here's a friend of mine and partner. He's been telling scientists for a long time, Mr. Tata of India, new products designed to the poor and the middle class, rising middle class. And the other way to say it is you have to have amazing invention so that you have very simple systems. And behind here is proton-coupled electron transfer, self-healing catalysts. And that allows you to operate out of a glass of water in a simple way. And staying with the hamburger theme, we're now open to serve 7 billion. So thank you. <laughs>